Good afternoon. Thank you, Bob. So, um, as Bob said, I'm going to be talking about the human dimensions of ecosystem services. Because, essentially, if we're managing ecosystems, we really need to be managing people. And if we're going to apply the great science that we've been hearing about over the past couple of days and develop um, management tools that are effective and equitable and also meet the needs of people, then we really need to understand how people use and interact with their environments, how they value and prioritize those interactions, and why. So the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment define ecosystem services as the benefits that people obtain from nature, from ecosystems. They categorize these benefits into four categories of services. So provisioning services, uh, the, the products that we gain from nature, such as fish through a fishery. Regulating services regulate the environment. So where we have a barrier reef system that buffers the force of the waves, this provides protection to the shoreline from that force. And cultural services are the non-material benefits. So these provide cognitive development, um, spiritual enlightenment, um, re uh, recreation, and reflection. These three categories of benefits are only possible because you've got a fourth category, which are the supporting services. And these are the ecological processes that are necessary for intact ecosystems to persist. So ecosystem services emerged as a concept really to address the trend of biodiversity decline, of ecosystem decline. So at the core is an effort to sustain biodiversity. But ecosystem services realized that these ecological systems and their social systems are inextricably linked. So that any attempt to, to sustain biodiversity really needs to address the interlinked nature of these systems. So an ecosystem services approach posits that human well-being is dependent on a productive and functioning ecosystem environment. So um, <clears throat> this really puts human well-being at the core of sustainability debates. And the policy implications of this are based on the assumption that behavior can be understood as the pursuit of well-being. So if we can demonstrate how people's well-being are dependent on functioning and productive ecosystems, then behavior should change to protect those ecosystems. But well-being itself is a complex concept. And McGregor has defined it as a state of being with others, which arises where human needs are met, where one can act meaningfully to pursue one's goals, and where can one can enjoy a satisfactory quality of life. So there are, there are multiple dimensions to this concept of well-being. And Sarah Coulthard has identified three um, categories of well-being. So you've got material well-being, which is what a person has. And a lot of ecosystem services research has really focused on quantifying these material aspects of well-being. Relational well-being relates to what a person does through their social relationships with what they have. So this afternoon, Louisa Evans is going to talk about how leaders can influence what people can do with their, their natural environment. <clears throat> and together, material and relational components of well-being interact to influence people's subjective well-being. So this is how people actually value their natural environment. My research tries to look at all, all concept, all of these components of human well-being. So three interrelated elements of ecosystem services that I'm going to talk about today that are of relevance to well-being are firstly, how do different people prioritize ecosystem services? Secondly, what gives people the capability to benefit from ecosystem services? And finally, what motivates people to prioritize these specific benefits? So the data I'm going to present is from the Western Indian Ocean, which is where I'm from. And it's from 28 communities across four countries. And these communities are coral reef fishing communities, so people are intimately connected to their environment. And over 90% of the dependents are from fisher families. I conducted a series, um, with others as well, of focus groups and interviews. Um, 30 focus groups that were designed to firstly um, identify how resource users um, conceptualized the benefits that they associated with their marine environments. And then I, I associated these benefits with the e uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment categories. And then explored why it was that people were motivated to prioritize or to value these benefits that they identified. I then conducted a series of um, interviews um, to firstly 
get uh, res the respondents to prioritize the ecosystem service benefits that they had, so quantify their priorities, but then to get an idea of how satisfied people were with the current status of quo, to try and um, quantify how important they considered a change or an improvement in these ecosystem services were. So if you think of a fishery, you can consider a fishery to be very important, but then a second dimension of the importance is how important would an improvement in your catch or yield be? So what were the priorities that people across the Western Indian Ocean assigned to these ecosystem services? So surprisingly, there was surprising consistency between how important people thought the benefits they identified were and how important they thought an improvement in those benefits were. There was also surprising consistency in the order of priorities across communities and also across countries. So this diagram is a simplistic, it simplifies the relationship, the order of priorities. So it's perhaps not surprising that fishers thought fishery was the most important benefit, but the ordering was also consistent below that. But this was a lot of data from a lot of countries, a lot of communities in a number of countries. And what aggregating values like this does is it, is it masks the variation that exists and it also masks what the shape of that variation may look like. So I wanted to see how the values that people in communities and countries varied as the importance, uh, with importance. So the first graph that you can see on the left-hand side Along, up the y-axis is, is a measure of variation, so it's just standard deviation here. And along the bottom axis is the, 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 the estimate that was assigned to the ecosystem service benefit. And the dots represent benefits and countries. So what you can see is as the importance of these ecosystem services increased, their variation decreased. So the more important services, as you can see in the bar in green, fishery, there was more agreement that fishery was important, whereas the less important services, materials, recreation, and culture, there was less agreement, which is probably a good thing. But when we looked at how important an improvement in the ecosystem service benefits were, the relationship was the other way around. So the more important these benefits were, so fishery again, the more variable the estimates that people assigned to them. What this means is that there was less agreement as to whether an improvement in the fishery values was important. And so a, an, an, a rational uh, um, solution, I suppose, to, to these, this kind of data, the first set of data, would be to pursue fishery benefits. But without looking at the variation that exists, you'll have a, a lot of winners, but you'll also have a lot of losers because of the high variation. So the apparent consensus in the order of importance of ecosystem services shouldn't mask considerable heterogeneity that exists in individuals' priorities. To examine this heterogeneity a little bit further, I'd like to take you back to the ecosystem services idea. So the theory is that a su supply of ecosystem services, a healthy ecosystem, will deliver benefits to people. But whether people are able to benefit from this supply of ecosystem services will depend on their access to the environment. So access can be thought of as their legal access, but there's also more complex concepts associated with access. So I've identified eight here from the literature and categorized them into economic access mechanisms. So if you look at the top one markets, you can think a person who has access to a market is gonna be able to catch fish and sell it and get more money for it. And this afternoon, Mike Fabini is going to talk about how markets contribute to the seafood trade, global markets contribute to the seafood trade. But also, knowledge access mechanisms influence how people can benefit from the environment. So, for example, people who are aware of the regulating services are more likely to appreciate them. If you've experienced a loss in water quality, you're more likely to value how important those processes that sustain water quality are. And social access mechanisms, so for example, social identity. People who um, <clears throat> feel very attached to their physical environment, so their sense of place is wrapped up in where they are, are more likely to benefit and experience the cultural values associated with that place. So in the individual interviews, I also measured these eight access mechanisms at an individual and also a community scale. I ran a redundancy analysis on the data so the points that you can see here are different communities, the 28 communities studied, 
And I wanted to see how the benefits, the individuals, the, 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 the importance of the ecosystem service benefits were associated with the access mechanisms. So the, site, the distribution in the sites was driven by differences in people's priorities. So you can see there's some clustering in types of priorities. So for example, at the bottom there, people who prioritize bequest tended to also prioritize education and cultural values. Whereas over to the left-hand side, people who prioritize fishery also tended to prioritize material values. And these values were associated with access mechanisms. So firstly, looking at economic access mechanisms, people who prioritize sanitation and coastal protection values had, had greater access to markets. So Josh Sinner's work in the region has shown how where communities are communities who, who um, along a great development gradient, which is associated with access to markets, tend to have a lower reliance on the resource. So that's the associated lower fishery values that you can see on the left-hand side of the ordination. Knowledge access mechanisms were also associated with these similar values. And it's knowledge and economic access mechanisms that development and environmental agencies tend to invest in when they're trying to build capacity in communities. But it's interesting to note that it's these social access mechanisms that are actually impor um, important for mediating the ability of people to benefit from a much wider variety of ecosystem services. So this um, summarizes the, ana the, the, the previous analysis. What you can see in the bars in color are the different ecosystem services. So you can see four different groups of clusters. So the bars in blue, people who prioritize coastal protection also tended to prioritize sanitation values. And the bars in green, you can see at the bottom, people who tended to prioritize fishery also prioritized materials. And these priorities were associated with key access mechanisms. And it was these social access mechanisms that enabled people to benefit from three different types clusters of ecosystem services whereas the knowledge and economic access mechanisms also enable people to benefit, but from only two of the access uh, bundles. So access mediates the benefits that people perceive and gain from nature. But it's, it's the social and relational components of access that have the greatest influence on how people benefit. So the last section of data I want to present is addressing the question of why it is that people prioritize specific benefits. So if we think of a benefit such as fishery, it's often assumed that the motivation for those benefits is food or income. And this brings with it an associated management solution. So if we assume people are dependent, prioritize fishery because of the food and income, then to relieve the fishing pressure that we've heard is one of the greatest impacts on our coral reef systems, as an obvious solution would be to bring in alternate livelihoods. But we know from the work of people like Richard Polnack, and I'm sure a lot of us in the room are aware, that people are actually motivated to fish for a whole variety of reasons. And identity and status often comes up as a far greater motivation than food or income. And this would bring with it a whole different suite of management solutions. So human values in social psychology are defined as an expression of people's motivational goals or desires in context of their needs and constraints. It's generally accepted that a small number of widely shared values exist. And Schwartz has identified, for example, 10 human values, and you can see them on the inside of this circle. I don't want you to pay too much attention to the types of values. But he's arranged these values around a circle because values that are adjacent to one another are more similar and often overlap in motivations, whereas values that are in opposition to it across the other side of the circle are in opposition to one another. So activities that enhance one type will actually impact the other. These 10 values he further categorized into four value domains, which is what I'll talk about. Self-transcendence values are motiva re represent motivations for tolerance and protection, for example, of nature. And in opposition to these self-transcendence values are these self-enhancement values, which is much more about the individual, about yourself. And these are motivated by a desire for social status and prestige. Traditionalism values are motivated by the desire to, for harmony and stability of society. And in opposition to these traditionalism values are openness to change values, and they're motivated by the desire for excitement and novelty.
So if we go back for a minute to the focus groups that I did at the start. After identifying the various benefits people associated with the environment, I was also interested in examining why it was people were motivated to prioritize these benefits. These are just a few examples of the type of motivations that people came up with. So for example, people did identify fishery, food and income as a motivation for their fishery benefits, but they also identified the motivation of being known as a skilled fisher. If you look at the cultural benefit, people identified the motivation to create and maintain social norms. So I, what I did was I compared these motivations that we identified in the qualitative focus groups to 57 items that are generally collected when um, social psychologists um, evaluate people's human values. And I assigned each ecosystem service benefit to its associated human value domain. So what I found? The colour hasn't come out very well on this, but culture, bequest and education, which are these more traditional cultural values, were associated with the motivations for tradi traditionalism values, so harmony and stability of society. In opposition to these were, more with, were recreation values, so more modern articulations of cultural values, and these were motivated by the, uh, the motivation for excitement and novelty. Fishery and material benefits, which are provisioning services, were motivated by self-enhancement values, so about the self. Whereas in oppos opposition to these were your regulating and supporting services that were motivated by self-transcendence values. One thing I'd like to point out here is the, the, the plot that you can see on the left-hand side is derived from these qualitative in um, focus groups. And the grouping um, is based on social th theory from social psychology. But you can compare the clustering based on the quantitative prioritizations. And not only are the clustering, not only is the clustering consistent, but also the positioning of these more traditional cultural values being in opposition to these more modern cultural values and your fishery and materials provisioning values in opposition to your coastal protection, sanitation and habitat regulating values. And the positioning of these types of values it, 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 uh, around the circle from each other is associated with these trade-off characteristics. So you're likely to see trade-offs occurring between more traditional cultural values and more modern cultural values. While similarly, you're likely to see these trade-offs emerging between these provisioning values and these regulating and supporting values. So to summarize, oh, that, that last graph. So ecosystem service motivations do align with broader human value motivations. Certain benefits have similar motivations and they're likely to co-occur, whereas others have motivations that are in conflict and they're likely to reflect these trade-off characteristics. So in summary, ecosystem services do contribute to well-being. But to understand these contributions, we really need to examine ecosystem services in a multi-dimensional way. Now, I've talked a lot about social dimensions of ecosystem services, but it's important to note that you can't divorce these uh, social components of ecosystem services from the ecological components, so an understanding of an intact and functioning ecosystem. Not all ecosystem service benefits impact ecosystems. Social, economic, and knowledge access mechanisms enable people from, to benefit from nature in different ways. And together, this knowledge can be used to broaden the solution space and to better anticipate how people are likely to respond. So this is how we can develop more effective, but also more equitable management solutions. And I'd just like to acknowledge a number of individuals and funding sources. Thank you. Thank you.